Hello, welcome to the September edition of the Nutritionist Webinar 2016. I am Marianne Fessenden from Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems and serve as your English language host. These webinars provide access to technical seminars by internationally recognized speakers. Usually, the series presentations are held in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. This month, Marcelo Hens Ramos is unable to present. He has a conflicting meet. Mar Marcos Neves Pierre will be listening and asking questions, but there will be no Portuguese language presentation. Paula Torillo from Argentina is here and is hosting the Spanish language webinar. There will be a post-presentation question and answer period during which listeners can submit questions through me or Paula, a complete recording of archived webinars, as well as the question and answer session for each will be available through AM. We are very pleased to have Dr. Tom Taluki here today as our second repeat presenter. Tom was raised on a 65 cow dairy farm in Eastern New York State. He attended Cornell University where he received his BS, Master's and PhD in Animal Science. Tom's PhD work focused on predicting phosphorus excretions of cattle and implementing Six Sigma quality control principles on commercial dairy farms. Upon his PhD in 20, 2002, he continued with the development of the CNCPS and began consulting with feed industry. In 2005, he left Cornell University to start Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, LLC, AMTS. As a co-inventor of CNCPS, Tuluki has been focused on ensuring the core biological model is implemented correctly for day-to-day -day ration formulation. AMTS, of which Tuluki is president and CEO, develops, trains, and provides nutritional technical support for nutritionists and feed industry globally. Tuluki has over 150 publications, including journal articles, book chapters, extension articles, and popular press. He is a member of the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists, where he is a board-certified animal nutritionist. In addition to AMTS, Tuluki is partner on a 650-cow dairy in New York State. His wife, Bonnie, is a veterinarian, and they have two children. They live near Ithaca, New York. Today, Tom is ostensibly presenting about advanced formulation, but in reality, he is talking about and jot down your questions to be ready for the question and answer period. His talks are always informative. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'd say good evening or good morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, and as Marianne said, this is going to be more of whatever I want to talk about. There's been a lot of confusion that we've seen the last, oh, 12 to 18 months uh, as some things have been released. So the first part of what we're going to go through is to try and clear up some of that. So when we look at where a lot of these sources of confusion come from, we have uh, this whole issue of ANDFOM versus just NDF, uh, changing from a single time point, NDF digestibility versus three time points, UNDF, uh, some people that are trying to do this just using only two time points, these differences in, carbon, in NDF pools and rates, on UNDF as a percent of body weight. Uh, all of these ha have come to our attention as questions and, and some things that have been, that we've seen people doing in the field that uh, have kind of brought us to the conclusion that we need to come back and, re and revisit some of these things. Let's go through this NDF versus ANDF OM first. The term NDF has always been misused, uh, and it's been misused because there's been adaptations to the method, uh, and all the labs, a lot of labs were doing things slightly different. Uh, so the result that you got was dependent upon the lab and depending upon the method that they used, yet everyone still calls it NDF. So let, let's take a step back here. What's it supposed to represent? It's supposed to represent how much in total cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin is in the plant, is in the cell wall. But there's a couple things here that, that NDF by, doesn't in, take into account. There's nitrogen within the NDF matrix that the base NDF method does not remove. And then there's also soil contamination. So then, then when we get into really starchy feeds like corn silage or small grain silages, 
that starch will plug the filters and you will get a artificially inflated NDF value. So all of these things give can give pretty widely variable NDF values. Pete Van Seuss and Jimmy Robinson had been working on this for years. And they knew that that by changing the the original method somewhat, they could they could remove a lot of these contaminants and actually improve the re repeatability of the uh, results. Dave Mertens, uh, who was with USDA uh, Dairy Forage Research Center, continued to work on this through his whole career, and about 10 years ago got AOAC approval for an NDF method. Anybody that had ever done anything with NDF never thought Dave would pull this off. Uh, there's just there was so much variance between labs that we all viewed it as an impossible thing to achieve because of the inherent variance. But he was able to do it, and he was able to do it by going with some of these things that Pete and Jimmy had done over the years. And this is where some of these letters come in. Dave decided it was time that we more accurately describe the term. So instead of just having it be NDF, we now have the first step was ANDF. And that little A means that alpha amylase was added to the solution. And that's really useful in high starchy feeds because it removes, it degrades that starch and allows it to filter better. The second is the addition of sodium sulfite to the NDF solution. That gets rid of at least 50% of the nitrogen that's in the NDF matrix. It doesn't get rid of all of it, but it does get it rid of at least half. The major labs in the US had adopted this method a long time ago, and they still called it NDF. And the reason that they adopted the method was improved throughput, especially with things like corn silage. Uh, and it also gave them more repeatable results. Uh, so that, that was a great first step, but again, they, they still called it NDF. But there was a lot of labs as we look globally that were not using these methods and they still called things NDF. So it, that we still had all this confusion. The National Forage Testing Association in the U.S., their certification for NDF has used ANDF for years. They still called it NDF. And to get certified to reach the, the, the level of certification, the, the participating labs had to use the method with sulfite and amylase. Dave continued to push this harder, and so we still, now we're thinking of all of that as ANDF. Okay, that's ANDF by itself is on a dry matter basis. The second step with this, though, was this whole issue of soil contamination. Silica is not soluble in NDF solution. It is an ADF solution, so this was never an issue with ADF. And as we all know, between the larger equipment, dust, the irrigation, especially flood irrigation, there's a lot of soil contamination that can get on these plants. So the only way to account for this is to do an ash on the ANDF residue. That removes, every, that removes everything but the soil. So we can do this correction to account for this ash contamination. What that does is it puts ANDF on an organic matter basis. So that's what the OM component is. This can change the result anywhere from one to 20 units of ANDF based on how much soil was in the sample. The result of this is it puts any of that difference into soluble fiber. So we were always, if, if we don't do a, if we don't do ANDF OM, we are artificially saying that there's more NDF and less soluble fiber. And, and that can get pretty significant when we start looking at some of these feeds that take an alfalfa hay that can have a fair amount of soluble fiber 
which ferments more with rates more like starch versus an NDF pool that degrades much slower. So th this can really change some, some numbers around pretty tremendously. And because remember, we calculate soluble fiber by difference. So it's total carbohydrates minus acids, minus sugar, minus starch, minus NDF. So it's that it's basically the kitchen sink. It's everything that's carbohydrate that's not that we don't directly measure. So this is this is the pool that we're manipulating by going to the OM. We've been asked multiple times around the world if we can't simply subtract the ash from the ANDF result to estimate ANDF organic matter. And you really cannot do this. You don't even try to do it, please. Uh, and the reason for that is if we look at, if we do an ash on a full sample, that contains soil contamination and normal minerals, okay? And we don't have, typically on an analysis, we don't have all of the minerals that are potentially there analyzed. Yet they, um, the standard minerals are soluble in, in NDF solution. The only thing that's not soluble is the silica. So if you try and do this adjustment by taking ANDF minus ash, you are going to be over adjusting the, the potential organic ash contamination. And the only thing that I'll say is if your lab's not doing things on an NDF organic matter basis, push them to adopt this. This is, um, this is Merton's got two methods approved with AOAC. One's just the ANDF with the preference being the ANDF OM. So this is all laid out in that publication. Uh, and if a lab's not going to do it, and if you give them enough pressure and they still won't do it, change labs. Uh, it, it's a pretty blunt thing to say, uh, but it is the reality of the situation, uh, especially in some of these areas of the world where these ash contaminations can be extremely high. Then we get into NDF digestibility. And this has probably introduced so much confusion around uh, the industry that, that I'm hoping I can clear some of this confusion up. What are we really trying to measure when we do NDF digestibilities? The immediate response is NDF digestibility, you know, how much of that's going to degrade in the rumen. But that's really a simplification of, of what we're really trying to do. What we're really trying to do is to determine the digestibility of the potentially digestible NDF, okay? So the, this potentially digestible NDF is the ANDF organic matter minus that unavailable NDF. Historically, and this is still the way we do it in the model, what we're looking at is calculating carbohydrate B3, which is the NDF minus the, carbo the carbohydrate C pool. Sounds pretty simple. And, and here's where this potentially digestible NDF gets really interesting. Here's three examples. They could all have exactly the same 30-hour NDF digestibility. But the rate of these three ingredients would be drastically different because the size of the unavailable pool varies tremendously, which means that the potentially digestible, the orange bar, changes. So to get the same NDF, overall NDF digestibility, the rate of, the, of degradation for this one with the, with the smallest potentially digestible NDF pool, the rate on this is going to be the highest because the pool size is the smallest. It, it, it gets a little tricky to try and visualize this, and I've, I've been trying to come up with how to show that. Um, and, and this is the best way I was able to do this I, that I could come up with. So it's dependent upon the size of that unavailable pool that changes the pool size of the potentially digestible NDF. But again, all three of these could have the same 30-hour NDF digestibility. 
or if we put it this way, the NDF digestibility is simply telling us how much of the total NDF deg can degrade in the rumen. It really gives us an index. It doesn't really tell us how fast that's going to happen or how much of the NDF is going to escape or how we need to know the potentially digestible component. And, and that, that's something that, that really, when you start looking at these different ingredients, is a great number to start thinking about is not so much the NDF per se, as much as how much of it is unavailable versus potentially digestible. Now, if we lived in a perfect world, we would be able to say that the unavailable NDF was lignin. Okay, in this case, we would be assuming that hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin are independent. They're sort of, uh, you could think of, of the cell wall then in like layers and bricks, where the bottom layer would be lignin, then cellulose, and hemicellulose. The problem is we don't live in a perfect world. And NDF per se is not a uniform fraction because it's actually made up of these three components. So there's been attempts over the years of how to describe this. One of them, and this is what's used in, in the NEL and TDN equations in the dairy NRC, uh, and this is based off of some old Ohio State work, tries to, to relate uh, the unavailable NDF with lignin in a surface area relationship. So it's actually, think you have to think of it like hemicellulose and cellulose is, is in a ball and the, the coating on the outside is lignin preventing anything from degrading. Doesn't work real well and neither does what the Cornell model has used for years which is this 2.4 times lignin relationship, which is, you can think of it as a touching relationship, where every, for every gram of lignin, that it, everything that it touches 2.4 times its mass is unavailable. Okay, probably not that great either when we think about what lignin really does. Lignin cross-links with things. And as, as we cross-link, so here's basically the same diagram that shows things independent. So this could be a, a strand of hemicellulose, and this could be a strand of lignin. But when they cross-link and they touch, the whole thing becomes unavailable. This changes not only by species, but also by stage of maturity as to how much this cross-linking occurs. Then you throw in environmental factors. Uh, flood irrigation is a great example of, of something that directly increases this cross-linkages. So over uh, the last 15 years or so, all this research at, at, uh, at Cornell and, and other places found that that 2.4 factor really isn't, it, it's, it's not a consistent factor. It actually varies between one to nine, depending on the crop type, the hybrids, stage of, uh, stage of maturity, environmental conditions. So that was when they just, everyone decided we needed to do uh, something new that could give us a better uh, estimate of what the truly unavailable NDF was. And that's where we start getting into this three-point multi-time point in vitro. And people have asked me, why did they go in vitro versus in situ? Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One is overall sample retention. Uh, there are some feeds that they, they looked at uh, with filtration that over 30% of the particles can escape the, the in situ bags. Uh, so that is a huge problem because when you do the mathematics with in situ, anything that, that's lost out of the bag is considered degraded. Okay, And, and we know this isn't true. There, with omeso sampling, we've been able to show that this is not true. So this would be overestimating how much of something is degraded in the rumen. The other issue is the ability to do this commercially in a lab. 
to do in situ, you've got to have a lot of cows, takes a lot of time, a lot of manpower versus being able to do it in vitro. Uh, you know, there's a lab not far from us that has the capacity to run thousands of in vitros at the same time and with just a handful of cows to supply rumen fluid. So it's a much more efficient and much more controlled system. The original work, they did lots and lots of time points. Uh, they went out as far, in some cases, to 288 hours. Uh, there's some work out, uh, out of um, the Nordic countries that, that uses in situ, and they go out as far as 288 hours. Uh, but from all of these time points uh, and a whole bunch of modeling, uh, what they were trying to find by using all these time points was to find an endpoint that estimated the unavailable NDF, and then working with the labs, what time points could be commercial, commercially viable. So let's, if we go back, okay, this is, there's another terminology issue here. We call it UNDF. You'll see in the literature or uh, some people talk about INDF. And INDF, we can really go back to some work that, that uh, Van Seuss lab, they went out as far as 30 days or longer with, with long-term in vitros to try and get at an estimate of the truly indigestible NDF. It's really difficult to do. There's a lot of variance in the results because you start getting into very small amounts of residue uh, and the fermentations tend to change. You start getting out to 15, 20 days and longer, other microbial species can start taking over that will cause uh, changes in, in the fermentation that in nature with a tree, for example, a tree rotting in the forest. Yeah, this can be true but these are not biologically relevant time points to cows. So Van Amberg's group, when they, when they developed this, looked at what time points are biologically relevant. Thus, we have UNDF, which is unavailable NDF. That differs from INDF because with U, there's still some potential, potentially digestible carbohydrate there. But the fermentation times required to do that are not relevant to what we do with cows. So people will say, you know, you versus I. Well, when we're talking cows, we, we, we're talking you. Let, let's just be biologically relevant here. So the time points that, that they've settled on and that the labs are, have implemented, for forages, they found that 30, 120, and 240 provided adequate sensitivity so that we could capture the majority of the, of the variance in NDF digestibility, okay? For non forage 12, 72, and 120. Now the difference is because of how these things degrade, particle size differences, how the cross-linking varies between them. So they have, so the non forages behave pretty confusing. Especially when we start talking about some of the some of the uh, guidelines that people have started discussing, being U240 as a percent of body weight or or U30 as a percent of body weight, it it, it gets really you start pulling your hair out pretty quickly trying to figure out which ends up. So let's take a step back. It's not the time points that are important to the cow. The cow could care less what time points we're measuring. They, all they are are lab, lab endpoints that allow us to then take the next couple of steps. And those next couple of steps are estimating the UNDF and the potentially digestible NDF, and then determining the degradation rates for those for the potential potentially digestible. UNDF, simple, unavailable to the cow, so we're, we're we use that strictly to determine the potentially digestible so that we can estimate microbial yield. But then there's, then there's the rates. Now, this starts getting us into some new thinking. You know, we've looked at NDF for how, how many years? Then with the introduction of the Cornell model, 
we really started looking at, at this whole available and unavailable NDF or potentially digestible NDF and unavailable NDF. So we had so we were dealing with basically a carbohydrate B3 and carbohydrate C. I would be fine and, and we've lived with that for how many years now? And it would be great if that potentially digestible NDF was was a single compound, single it's not. It's a mix of cellulose and hemicellulose, and those ratios are not fixed. So things are, are pretty inconsistent here. So what we're starting to talk about, and, and this is where these time points start to come, potentially digestible NDF is actually a blend of a fast pool and a slow pool. So thinking about it in terms of the model, we're actually looking at going to, I hate to do this to everyone, you can think of carbohydrate B3 being the fast pool of NDF, B4 being the slow pool, and then C being unavailable. Now, we haven't implemented that in the model yet. Uh, and, and there was a couple of reasons why that hasn't occurred yet. One of them was knowing we wouldn't have all of the time points for, especially for non-forages, available uh, to populate feed libraries, as well as the labs being able to develop NIRs calibrations. It takes a lot, a lot of time, especially on, on the non-forages, to get those calibrations developed. It's coming though. This is the direction we're going. And, and this is actually more the way to start thinking is how much fast pull versus how much slow pull of potentially digestible NDF is there. People talk about a 30 hour and a 240 hour. People are, it's confusing to everyone. Remember, these values only apply to forages. And if you're only talking one time point, it's pretty much meaningless because things are a blend, okay? Start thinking in fast, slow, unavailable. And this is what, if we pull the, pull the data apart, this is what things look like. So this is the single degradation rate, okay? The orange line. The green is the unavailable pool, but you can see a clear differentiation here of this fast pool the slow pull. And you notice here, so this would be about 30 hours right here. So a 30 hour value is actually a blend of the fast and the slow. Here's some uh, data from, from Van Amberg's lab on some byproducts. Okay, gluten feed, you can see, we could say actually has somewhat of a uh, large slow pull versus something like beet pulp which has a larger fast pool. Wheat mids, there's a lot of variation. And this, this is a really interesting one. This is, here's six different mids that I went through and calculated uh, the fast and slow and UNDF pools. See a somewhat of a spread here, 21 to 29% uh, UNDF. But look at the split between the fast and the slow anywhere from almost 50% fast down as low as 34% fast pull. So the, the room and kinetics are going to change tremendously uh, in terms of, especially when we start looking at what's controlling dry matter intake and fill. Fill, and I'll come back to this again, it's really a combination of these two problem that we've also run across is there's a number of people that are only getting a 30 hour and a 240 hour back. And we've seen some scary things that people have tried to do. Great example is all I do is calculate the average of the two. Okay. So they take whatever the 30 and the 240 hour is, do an average of that to represent the 120. You can't do this. Don't do this. If you're doing this now, please stop. 
Here's why. If you averaged it, here's two, just two example feeds. If you averaged it, you end up with this sort of a straight line versus the real data, okay? So by averaging it, we are moving, we are getting rid of where that inflection point is. And that's one of the things we're really interested in in, determ in determining this fast versus slow pools is where are these inflections? And if you're just doing a simple average, it's actually mathematically wrong because 120 is not the center point of 30 and 240. So even if, if you're doing an average of 30 and 240, that is not what, anywhere close to what a 120 is going to be. It's, it's both mathematically incorrect and it's fermentation characteristics is incorrect because you're changing that inflection point. And I'm probably going to take heat for this, but if you're not getting three three time points from your lab, you've got two options. Work with them to get that third time point, and if they say that they can't do it or they won't do it, change labs, folks. There's plenty of labs that are doing this. Um, it's just the way it is. Um, so then we also see people, can I... Just look at the 30-hour number, the 120 and the 240, and try and estimate what, what the fast and slow pulls are. Again, you can't because that 30-hour is a blend of the two. What's worse is if we talk non-forages, we don't have a 30-hour value. Okay, and, and what you'll see when you start looking at things in fast pull versus slow pull, that these things move around, can move around tremendously, and they have huge impacts. If we look at changing the fast pool, this is where we get faster eating rates, faster ruminal disappearance, disappearance, higher intakes. Slow and UNDF pools, chewing and rumination, lower intakes, they eat slower. The other thing that we've seen is some people trying to just co-mingling old and new unavailable NDF and calling it UNDF240. Again, this is wrong. First of all, we're talking different endpoints on non-forages versus forages. And it's even, it's the basis of it's wrong because lignin times 2.4 has been proven to not equal UNDF. Here's a really good example of this. This is canola meal, 28% ANDFOM, 8.2% lignin, and here's the three time points for the MDF digestibilities. So if we calculate the pools, using the lignin times 2.4 would say that canola was 70%, 70% of, of the NDF was carbohydrate C, and only leaving a potentially digestible pool of just about 30. Using the three time points, we find that the C pool, the unavailable pool, is only 40%. Look at this shift in potentially digestible NDF that we have here. If we put this into the, into the model at feeding four pounds, okay, and just changing the pool size and the rates, that's a pound uh, shift in ME and MP allowable milk, 13 grams of MP, gram of lysine, gram of methionine, and 175 grams lower carbohydrate C that uh, is counted as U. So if we're, trying to, if we're trying to move to this U NDF concept, start working, start getting samples done on the non-forages. Uh, the models, the libraries are not populated, and there can be a lot of variance in these ingredients and it will really start changing how we look at these use as a percent of body weight. And here's a, an example. This is one of my herds. This is, and we, I've seen this repeatedly as we've done this over the years. You know, high producing herd, 40, 41 kilos of milk. Well, we were corn silage, alfalfa silage based. Uh, because of inventory and storage management, uh, we decided that we would
stop feeding the alfalfa and go to all grass silage. Uh, the UNDF 240s as a percent of body weight were lower when we were on when I switched to diets. ME and MPO level milk were similar, if not a little bit higher on the grass formulated diet. This was a good grass. This was uh, first cut uh, reed canary grass at 47% NDF. Well, the cows didn't think so. Intakes dropped about a kilo. Milk dropped over three kilos. Uh, we had a change in the grass silage where we went from 47 to 52 NDF. Lost another kilo or more of intake. Lost more milk. But let's go back to these guidelines that people are talking about. UNDF 240 as a percent of body weight was lower on the grass. It, I went from about 0.3 to 0.24. U30 was lower, but U120 was much higher. So we ended up, even though the U240 was lower, the slow pool was significantly greater. And we filled the rumens up, and that's why intakes collapsed on me. Uh, corrected it a little bit, uh, pulled out some of that grass silage and put more corn silage in and picked up uh, about two liters of milk. Hopefully, we are going to go back to feeding alfalfa silage end of this week or early next week, and we can pick up the rest of this milk that we lost. But it's going to take time. So it's a combination of looking at the slow, fast. Uh, we have to begin analyzing non-forages, and stop thinking about U or D at different time points. We've got to start thinking about fast and slow and unavailable pool sizes. I, I know I can say that right now uh, and have people come back to me and say, well, how do I come up with uh, how much is in the fast pool versus the slow pool? Uh, for now, what I'm telling people is as you put these values into the model, Look at what the, the U30, U120, U240 is as a percent of body weight and just start tracking that for to come up with your own relationships until we start reporting the fast and slow pools. This is coming, folks. This is, uh, it may be, you know, it might not be fully implemented until version 7 of the model comes out, which will be, who knows. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you start tracking these and developing your own guidelines, you, you will definitely start to see trends in intake and production responses based on all three of those time points. You just don't look at one anymore. All right, we'll switch a little bit now to nitrogen and some starch. Uh, this is, to me, this is a classic study anymore. Uh, it's from 2006. Uh, differences in dietary crude protein and looking at what happens to all this nitrogen. Milk nitrogen, if they had milk nitrogen on this graph, it was basically flat. All the excess nitrogen went, you know, fecal nitrogen's flat. It's all urinary nitrogen. So these girls, once, we, once they meet the requirements for nitrogen, anything extra, they're just going to pee out. Uh, some of it will be recycled, and we're going to come back and talk more about this recycling of nitrogen. Uh, but this is where we start seeing increased MUNs and increased urinary. Oh, just a you know, look at the quick flow of where all this nitrogen goes, how it works in the rumen. Uh, everything goes back and forth between the bloodstream and the liver and the kidneys. Do all this filtering and recycling. Uh, to keep her in somewhat of a nitrogen balance. This is very true. Models have historically underestimated the amount and efficiency of... Uh, this is an issue that, that comes up uh, where the NIR calibrations that labs or that milk labs use for, for uh, milk urea nitrogens, a lot of them did not 
have an intercept through zero. Uh, so that's slowly changing. Uh, so if you if you're running into low MUNs uh, through the Melk Labs, you've got to be pretty careful as to what number you're watching there. Uh, it depends on how uh, how good their calibration is in these lower ranges. Uh, if we knew, if you know that the lab's calibration starts at zero, then we can say that if we're less than six, uh, we're probably running the nitrogen, the, the room in short on nitrogen. Uh, if, if you want to look at it more closely, you know, PUNs are much more accurate, uh, and there's plenty of data showing that if we're less than six, uh, the urea nitrogen pool is too low. Uh, and there's got to be some safety in here because if we have feeding behavior changes, uh, feeding management, uh, dry matters, uh, content of forages isn't under control, uh, we could be running into times of nitrogen deficiency in the rumen during these periods. So if you're running low MUNs, uh, it's something to watch pretty closely. Uh, I normally tell people where I typically run, uh, and right now I'm sitting looking at some some uh, some bulk tank samples that have me scratching my head because I'm higher in crude protein than normal, and my MUNs are below six. Um, I'm baffled. So what are the models used currently for this recycled nitrogen? This is an old equation out of the 85 NRC. Uh, the, old, the old green, I've got it somewhere here, I don't remember the name, of ruminant nitrogen usage. There it is, I just saw it on the shelf. Uh, and it shows this curvilinear relationship with dietary crude protein. Now, it suggests that the amount of recycled nitrogen decreases as dietary nitrogen increases. This isn't nitrogen recycling. It's actually not labeled correctly. It's gastric reentry rate. And <laughs> it's cheap data. Uh, one trial, low versus high quality hay. So pretty limited data set. New work with cattle, uh, with, especially with dairy. Uh, this is mostly out of Europe, uh, Chris Reynolds and Christensen. Uh, looked at a whole range of protein levels. And I'm just going to jump to this slide because it really shows that as crude protein level of the diet changes, the nitrogen dynamics change tremendously. As we get into higher crude protein levels, the amount of nitrogen that's being recycled into the rumen or the gastric, uh, gastric entry rate goes down. So the cows telling or being told, okay, we have plenty of nitrogen. We don't need to bring as much into the rumen. Let more of it escape into MUN in urinary nitrogen. You can see that this is a pretty wide range of protein levels here uh, and that these animals are very efficient at moving this nitrogen around. Uh, further work from uh, uh, Cornell using double lab labeled urea uh, showed the same thing. So she is highly, highly efficient at moving nitrogen around where she needs it. And from some of the Cornell work, 50 to 70% of the nitrogen that she consumes is converted to urea. Uh, and on average, it gets recycled three times before it's either captured by in the gastrointestinal tract or is excreted. So we can take advantage of this by either reducing that, that amount of available ammonia uh, or by changing things like carbohydrate degradability to capture more of that nitrogen and as microbial. Another interesting thing that, that, uh, that Reynolds and Christensen paper found they weren't able to identify any negative effects from non-steady state feeding. Okay, so basically they looked at uh, slug feeding some grain uh, and they, they really weren't able to, to find where these cows, where rumen function was. It could very well be though that uh, they didn't push the rumen degraded carbohydrate levels around enough to be able to see this. 
uh, or that in some of those diets they weren't low enough in nitrogen to see this. Uh, it, it's, there's a lot of dynamics here that I think we can get into situations in low protein diets or with poor feed management where we potentially can be running into some nitrogen limitations, ammonia. And remember, you know, it's in, some of you may be, why did I talk about rumen degraded carbohydrates and ammonia? Well, it's, we have to talk about fermentation characteristics, carbohydrate availability, whenever we're talking about nitrogen and amino acids. You know, here, here's a great example. How much can we move MUNs around? Well, if we alter the room and degradation of carbohydrates, okay, if we increase degradation, we're going to get more microbial growth, and that's going to require more ammonia. The net result of that is we decrease MUNs. Simple one is just alter crude protein levels or shifts between RDP and RUP. And here's a great example of coming in with rumen protected amino acids. So this is actually a control and two different methionine sources, MUNs. You can see that the two acted differently. But we captured more protein, okay? So MUNs dropped. We didn't change crude protein levels of the diet or anything. This is simply the addition of of methionine, and we captured more total amino acids from the system. So we're using the overall nitrogen more efficiently because methionine was our first limiting amino acid. When we start looking at how we do this with carbohydrates, you know, we've got to come back thinking about where these carbohydrates are digested. And let's take starch. We're either going to have rumen degraded starch or rumen escape starch. If it's rumen degraded, when we combine that with nitrogen, we get bugs. And those bugs are going to give us VFAs, some lactic, and all of that's going to go into this energy pool. The escape starch, some of it will be intestinally absorbed, and that goes directly to glucose, and it's primarily used in the portal drain viscera for adipose metabolism. Starch that escapes that and ends up in the lower tract, there will be some fermentation. Okay, same thing as in the rumen, and all we get out of it is VFAs. We don't get any microbial protein out of it because it can't be absorbed. Everything else goes fecal starch. Meta-analysis, and, and if you don't have this paper, I highly recommend you go look at it. Uh, Journal of Dairy Science from 2013, uh, looking at cereal grain types and grain harvesting and processing methods. So here's... Uh, the relationship between dietary start, uh, actual dietary ruminal starch concentration, okay, digestible starch. So this is what was degraded in the rumen. Milk fat, milk protein. Pretty interesting. Increase in milk protein. Perfect sense. Grow more bugs. Better amino acid supply. Better amino acid pattern. Capture it as milk protein. If we look at different cereal grain types. Overall, wheat had an 80% digestibility, uh, ruminal digestibility, corn the lowest at 54, and barley was there at 71. What I don't show is, and there's only a few papers that looked at wheat, uh, was those few papers with wheat actually had a slightly depressed intake and a loss in, in milk and, and components. I think that's partially because there was only, well, here, there was only six papers, six treatments that looked at wheat. Particle size is one that, that of corn that, that people ask me about a fair amount. And I think one thing that we need to remember is when we talk about particle size, that we're talking geometrical mean. Uh, so that's got to be done with the multiple sieves. And you can see this is just on corn that... There's a pretty clear breakpoint in starch digestibility of once you get below uh, 1,500, uh, there's not much difference in growing finer than that. One thing that they did not try to examine in this paper was flowery versus vitreous 
uh, endosperm and its relationship with particle size. I don't think there's been an, there was enough data to be able to split that out in a meta-analysis like this. Uh, that would we would probably see some additional spread here between these lower these smaller particles, but I'm not sure. Uh, if we look at ensiled, so this is either high moisture or uh, high moisture ear corn. Again, there's a break point there of uh, less than 2,000 or over great or greater than 2,000. And a seven seven point six point uh, change in starch digestibility. This is one that that uh, we don't talk about enough, in, in uh, especially in the U.S. with all the differences in steam rolled versus steam flaked. Uh, there's a th three point difference here. Uh, and rolled versus flaked. And they didn't really get into how big of a difference is there between uh, the different styles, the different uh, efficacy of roll of different steam rolled versus steam flaked. And I think this number is probably uh, bigger. The actual spread is actually larger that we have in, in the field uh, than what this meta-analysis found. So this is uh, total extract digestibility um, and ruminal starch uh, digestibility. You can see there's a very strong relationship there. And here's post-ruminal uh, versus total tract. Okay. So as, to, as total tract digestibility comes down, we see a reduction in both post-ruminal digestibility and ruminal uh, degradability. Uh, so we can basically say when we have corns uh, that are not going to ferment well in the rumen, they're not going to be that well uh, digested post-ruminally as well, and we're just going to see higher fecal starches. Uh, and we could actually, uh, and this, this is where uh, looking at some things with fecal starches, uh, we can actually start getting some, some of these estimates as to how efficiently uh, ruminal and post-ruminal digestibility is. You can see there's a pretty big range here, and, and here's total, total tract digestibility versus ruminal digestibility. And you see there's some pretty big ranges here, even uh, across the entire range. And this is probably due to processing uh, and, and particle size uh, differences. But the overall trend here is, is very clear. So it's basically saying if we don't get it captured in the rumen, uh, then we're going to lose overall starch digestibility. Uh, poor rumen digestion, uh, reduced intestinal digestibility. Grinding and uniformity of grind uh, is very important, and it goes back to um, this table of definitely should be less than 1,500. Uh, and in some cases, with some of these uh, uh, more vitreous corns, probably less than a thousand. And rolled corn is not the same as flake corn. Okay. Uh, and the easiest way to to start measuring that is to be tracking bulk densities on these. And and there's some pretty neat data out there to show that we can differentiate some of these things uh, purely based off of bulk density uh, post-processing. Uh, with that, I thank everyone for coming, and I know we're going to be taking questions. So it's back to you, Marianne. I want to thank Tom for that presentation. Before I open the floor for questions, I want to invite our listeners to attend the next webinar to be held on October 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Next month, we're moving outside the realm of traditional ruminant nutrition and listening to a presentation by Dr. Dave Barbano from the Food Science Department of Cornell University. Dave's research focus in the chemistry of milk has led to a collaboration with ruminant nutritionists in the area of preformed fatty acids. Dr. Heather Dan from the Minor Institute, who's been working with Dave, will join him in the question and answer period to help field nutrition-related questions. Save the date and time, October 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time of the year. I would like to thank the people who made this possible, Tom Taluki and AMTS USA and Global, 
Marcos Neves Piera, University of Lavras, Marcos Marcelo Hens Ramos at 3R Lab in Brazil, Paula Torillo in Argentina, as well as our translators in each location. Our generous sponsors make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids. Our silver sponsors are Arm & Hammer, Animal Nutrition, Virtus, Makers of Strata with EPA, D DHA Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Bronze sponsors are Jeffo, Life Made Easier, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, and Dairy, Dairy Land Laboratories and Quality Liquid Feed. This is from Doug Weed. Why is dry matter intake correlated with 30-hour UNDFOM, but not really with 120 or 240? Ah, uh, it's not, Doug. It's really, it's, a com it's all three. Uh, we can see intake go up as we have higher levels of 30-hour NDF digestibility. Again, think, think back to what a fast pull versus a slow pull in the unavailable would do. A fast pull is going to disappear quicker in the rumen. So if we just look at that side, okay? So if we look at the fast pull here, that's going to that's going to be degraded in the room and you know really quick. That that's I think the the degradation rate on that pool was like 11 or 12 percent per hour, versus the slow pool, which had about a one percent per hour, and then the U being unavailable. So total dry matter intake as we increase the size of the fast pool, total dry matter intake can come up because it's going to disappear in the room and, and she can eat more. Whereas total fill is dictated by the U and the slow. So if we change, if we shift formulations around so that we increase the size of the, of the fast pool, we can influence intake. So it's really, you've got to think about it in terms of the slow pool and the fast pool, if we draw a, a VAT. You, the unavailable pool is just going to sit there and can only escape by passage rate. The slow pool can, some of it will be degraded, some of it will be escape, but that's our total basically fill line. How much is in this fast pool dictates how much she can eat in total. So if we increase the size of the fast pool, say up to here, she can eat that much more because it'll be degraded in the room. It's, it's really, we got to be thinking about the integration of both the fast and the slow slash unavailable pools to be looking at total dry matter intake. Hi, Marcos. Do you have any questions? Yeah, they do. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Oh, right on. Thanks for the talk. And nice to be talking to you again. Yeah, nice, Marcos. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just going to make the first questions about the your proposal of the model for having a, I think, a three pool NDF uh, procedure, like you're proposing a B3, would be a fast pool, a B4, and the undigestible, right? Yep. Uh, yep. You're going to predict those things with the 30 hour, the 120, and the 240 hour degradation for forage, correct? Correct. And so, how. Are you going to have KDs for those pools? Because I, I can't see how can you generate a KD only with a with one thirty hour incubation. You understand? Like a, I think the thirty hour would be your prediction for the fast pool. You can predict the undigestible with one hundred forty. The potential would be a hundred percent times the undigestible, but. I can see you predicting a KD for the slow pool, but I can't see a KD for the fast pool. Could yeah. You, or, yeah. Or, or are you going to use like single, the, the estimation for the pool size in the model? Or how is it really going to work? Roughly? Actually, there, there, there's a, a dynamic model that's done in Vensim that actually splits... Uh, splits the, the, the curve into its component pieces. 
and, and can differentiate and it uses some optimization uh, routines to basically it's fitting it in, in multiple dimensions at once and to look at the fast pool, the slow pool, and the unavailable pool. And, and that's actually how these numbers are generated. Uh, it, so it's, it's all done through a dynamic model. Yeah, I, I see you can, can predict the pool size, but don't, don't you think you need a KD for the B3 and the KD? The B4 KD you can get the 30 and the other 20. But, I, for example, if you had a 24 and a 30, you, you, you could get the KD for or a 12 and a 30 or whatever for the, for the, for the fast pool. But the, I, I, I can see just your predicted pool size. Oh uh, no no! Oh, it, 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 this Vincent this Vincent model actually calculates the uh, the the rates. Uh, it, it's all uh, it's all based off of uh, Emiliano Referanto's uh, PhD work uh, when he was at Cornell. And let me let me dig for. Uh, that there's a couple uh, Cornell Nutrition Conference papers, uh, Marcos, that that uh, have have laid that all out. There's they're still working on getting the the manuscripts uh, submitted for publication, but I'll I'll find those CNC articles and, and send them to you. Let's see. This is from Jose Alp Alpizar. In case of grazing system, does Tom have any corn particle particle size suggestion? Yeah, that's always boy. Pasture systems can always be a fun one um, because immediately people want to start looking at going to a coarser grind size and the, and the thinking that it will uh, remain in the room and longer and, and uh, somewhat synchronized with nitrogen availability from pasture. The problem with that thinking, though, is, and there's some really neat work from Mike Allen on this in relation to corn particle size and its flow through the rumen, that as when we look at these passage rates on, on especially things like corn, they're so highly related with, with uh, not only particle size, but density uh, and, and hydration rate. So we get into these particles that want to sink. And if they are of the right size, when they sink, their potential to flow out of the rumen is extremely high. Um, so it, it's, there's always the risk of, of getting too much corn in per feeding uh, on pasture systems uh, if we go with small particle sizes, but we want to capture as much of that as possible. So it's really, uh, for the most part, what I've seen people doing is we're going with smaller uh, particle size uh, in, in, in those pasture-based systems. Uh, and that seems to be a, a, an acceptable compromise of capturing that starch uh, but fed at a level that we don't push those cows into clinical acidosis. So we're going to be in, in those smaller those smaller ranges uh, of the less than uh, 1,500. Okay, thanks. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate between questions from Paula and questions that I have in my question and answer window. And if Marcos has any more questions, if he'll just alert me, I can let him ask. So the next question is from Carlos in Argentina through Paula, and he asks, which are the factors that affect proportions of unavailable fast and slow pools in wheat middlings? Wow. <laughs> I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, my theory is, and again, this is just a theory, that uh, as we look at differences in hybrids uh, and differences between spring and winter wheats, that we will see those differences. Uh, I don't know how I don't know anything about those samples. If they were reds or whites, if they were spring or winter wheats, uh, but I'm sure 
that there's going to be differences between uh, uh, maybe even geographical regions uh, from what we know about corn and corn NDF digestibility. Uh, it would make perfect sense to uh, follow some of those similar patterns. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Dave Barbano. If you change the physical size of particles to increase starch utilization in the rumen, what happens to unsaturated fat release in the rumen and the effect of that on rumen microflora? I love these questions. <laughs> and I'm going to say, why don't you tell me, Dave? <laughs> uh, um, well, we know that as we... Yeah, boy, okay. So we make particle size smaller. Uh, and and all all that data, you know, when we looked at this graph that showed the milk fat uh, changing as rumen degraded starch goes up. Uh, so this is going and did this meta analysis also showed that as the rumen degraded starch increased, uh, ruminal NDF digestibility went down. Uh, it's going to be a straight. Uh, ruminal pH impact, which makes perfect sense. Uh, so not only are we changing uh, uh, the microflora uh, proportions, but we're also uh, going to be changing by hydrogenation rate. We're also going to be changing uh, probably in these smaller particle sizes, uh, release rate of, of uh, oils from corn, definitely. Um, but then everything related to uh, changing the biohydrogenation pathways are going to be altered as well. Uh, so it's it's a tricky combination because if we to get uh, more of that starts utilized, uh, we want it ground, we want it to be room integrated. Uh, but at the same time, does that directly impact have a negative impact that potentially on milk fat? Uh, precursors, uh, yeah, it does. Um, Tom, we have a lot of questions. This is great. I thought this would happen. Um, question two from um, Argentina, and this is again, Carlos, about using strips to determine MUN, what do you think about it? In my experience with high and low producing cows eating similar diet, the latter had higher values. Do you have any idea why that happened? Which had higher values, the lower producing cows? Um, I think so, yes. That's the way I read it. The latter uh, had higher values. Which would make perfect sense because the passage rate is lower when we get into these lower producing cows, late lactation cows. Uh, so we see more uh, dietary protein is degradable in the rumen. Uh, take soybean meal as an example. On a cow producing 40 liters of milk, the RUP on solvent soybean meal may be 50%. But on a, a late lactation cow giving, say, 20 liters, uh, it may be as low as 20%. Uh, so that, that as more as it takes longer time, as uh, it is exposed in the ruin for longer times, we're going to get more protein degradation, which all that's going to go into uh, urea and the ammonia pool and go through that whole recycled, uh, those recycling pathways uh, and either be milk urea or urin urinary nitrogen. Okay. Um, a question here in our English language webinar from Fausto Solis. I know that a very high level of NDF, NDF may affect the F. I, I'm not sure what that is, but um, maybe if I finish reading it, we'll figure it out. But how may I interpret and basically use or recommend the acid detergent fiber? Um, Tom, you may want uh, yeah, to rephrase yeah, that yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, ADF has, um, we can pretty pretty much say that, that ADF has, very little uh, uh, correlation with, with anything to do with dairy cattle nutrition anymore. Uh, if we look at all the all the systems, be it the, the 2001 NRC um, uh, or anything related to any of the models, uh, pretty much everyone's uh, 
everything's based off, off of NDF. Uh, and, and I think if, if we try and look at some of this with unavailable NDF and, and even the pool sizes that uh, ADF would would uh, would fail even even greater. Uh, the old the old thinking was ADF was and there's still a lot of places where ADF is used uh, to predict an NEL concentration of, of an ingredient. Uh, and within certain characteristics, you know, some of those equations are not bad, uh, but uh, there really is very very little correlation with ADF and. Um, a question from Paula, and this is from S Sebastian. Which are the expected differences in unavailable fast and slow pools between conventional and BMR corn silages? Uh, BMRs tend to always have a lower U, on uh, a, a smaller unavailable pool. And they also tend to have a higher fast, a uh, uh, higher proportion of fast pool than conventional corns, okay. and that, that's why we get that's why we get the intake responses on most BMRs. All right, um, a question from Stephen Emanuel. We have a lot of corn and alfalfa that has been stunted by drought in western New York. How will that change the size of the fast and slow pools? <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been sitting here staring at that question ever since. It popped up from Stephen, uh, and in general, Stephen. And if I could bring up, uh, if I if I had, if I could bring up some other slides, I would, uh, because I'm doing a, a trial uh, jointly with with uh, Sally Fields at Dairy One. Uh, we did it last year, and we're repeating the the repeating it this year, looking at corn silages from. Uh, three different locations, one in West, Eastern New York, one in uh, Cayuga County, and one in Western New York, uh, where we've got uh, all the soil and soil test information, everything yields, hybrids, uh, precipitation, temperature, all daily, uh, and the 31, 22, 40s. And there are some really interesting relationships here. Um, we could pick up, uh, we could really identify shifts in fast and uh, fast versus slow pool uh, in these corns last year uh, based on the temperature in May and the amount of rain in April. Uh, so some of this is, it's, we can go back to an epigenetic thinking where uh, the plant is determining what it's going to be when it grows up. Uh, early in its growth cycle, uh, and, and pretty much from from what we've seen over over time, uh, we've known for uh, that drought stressed uh, crops tend to have higher overall NDF digestibilities, uh, and I'm going to say based just on a little bit of data I've seen thus far that uh, we're going to see greater fast pool larger fast pools uh, than slow pools. So, <laughs> you know, uh, cows always do really well on, uh, typically do pretty well on drought stress crops because there's so much higher digestibility. Uh, so it's gotta be lower unavailable and larger fast. Okay. Um, so Tom, this and Jose apologizes, but I don't think he should because we have a fairly global audience and, and maybe acronyms are different. Can you please explain or expand upon PUN? Plasma, u urine, uh, plasma urea nitrogen. So instead of doing milk urea nitrogen, which is off milk sample, PUN is plasma. Okay. Um, Marcos, do you have any more questions? Yeah, I have a couple more. Okay, excellent. So, Tom, uh, I like the first slide, the confusion slide, <laughs> and <laughs> I would just add two more confusions, and I would like your opinion. Can, could you talk a little bit on physically effective NDF, PENDF, how to measure it, like 8 millimeter, 118, or whatever, and the other side of the equation is the ruminal degradation storage. 
uh, criminal storage degradation, sorry, uh, using one pool model, two pool models, and how to link both sides of the equation. Just some more confusion. <laughs> All right, let's do physically effective first. So let's go back to Merton's original definition of physically effective NDF. It is meant to integrate particle size, hydration rate, density, and degree of lignification. And everyone since then has been trying to, to correlate it with particle size only. So there's there's this difficult uh, transit difficult step here in that we're trying to use one measurement to basically represent several. The talking with Dave and, and when and when I when I go to this, um, I basically fall back and rely on on Dave's recommendations, and the best number that that. Dave would say the best best method that Dave would say to use right now is the new Penn State Shakers uh, box system, which is the four pans with the third pan being, I think it's five millimeters. Uh, he, he said that he told me repeatedly that when they came out with the pan with the 1.18, he, he kept telling them that that was the wrong size. It was too small. It did not represent uh, what he had done with the ROTAP vertical shaker. Um, so first option is, is to use that system with the five millimeter third pan. Uh, if you're like me and relatively cheap and have a box that's so old that you can't upgrade to that pan, uh, then just use the old three pan system where it's just got the, uh, the, the two screens and, and the bottom pan that, that method will be, will give you slightly, uh, conservative, uh, it'll underestimate the physically effectiveness, uh, but you can adjust your guidelines a little bit as to what number to use. The starch question is a troublesome one. Uh, right now, uh, you know, everyone's trying to use a single time point, a seven hour uh, uh, in vitro to try and get an estimate of, of, of rates. Uh, and that's, that's inadequate. Uh, there's a lot of Variation uh, when, I, when I've looked at difference is in flowery versus vitreous uh, particle size processing methods. Uh, we're going to we're going to end up probably there's there's a lot of debate and uh, is starch a two pool model or is it a, a single pool model? And I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, some starches behave as a single pool, some behave as a two pool or even a three pool where there's um, this similar type thinking with the, the multi-pool NDF where there's a fast starch, a slow starch, and a ruminally indigestible starch. Um, or maybe even we can go an in, or a overall unavailable starch to the animal. There's groups working on it. Uh, it's I've been hoping the last few years that that groups would come out with with some models on this. Uh, it's one of those though that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I even think even with all that said, I think it's even more complicated than what we can currently do when we include some of. Uh, uh, Mike Allen's work on differences in, in passage rate based on densities. Um, starch is a very tricky one to get a handle on. This is from Misaka, and he says, so fast pool NDF contributes to high dry, dry matter intake and milk production. And um, on the other hand, slow pool contributes to milk fat. Is that an accurate statement? That's a... That's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
right? Good. Yeah, I, there'll be there'll be milk fat will also come from fast pool because again, let's think about end products of NDF digestibility. End products of NDF digestibility are going to be acetate, butyrate, propionate. So it, it's we're going to see both. Uh, we, we typically see you know more milk volume response with more fast pool, but total milk fat yield uh, actually goes up too. So it's it's we're getting multiple end products and getting multiple responses. Okay, now I have a question from Paula. When we ask for NDF in the TMR, should we have the same same um, concept as using A and DFOM and the expect would the expected differences between NDF and A and DFOM um, be expected to be higher in the case of a TMR? <sighs> Uh, yeah, you know, and so the, the, the larger labs have pretty much updated the majority of their NIR calibrations to be ANDFOM based and that, that's regardless of single feeds or TMRs. I know on, on some, uh, concentrates, they don't have those calibrations up yet, but the concentrates aren't, aren't that big of an issue. An interesting one for doing TMRs on an ANDFOM basis, and this is extremely relevant in Brazil, Argentina, uh, especially, where there's not a lot of concrete that's used on bunk floors, uh, bunk silo floors and walls. Uh, so it can really be a good estimate as to how much dirt is the feeder putting into the mixer at the same time. Uh, which can cause all sorts of problems with changing nutrient concentrations, uh, clostridia, uh, yeast problems, mold problems, whatever. So I would actually, I think it would be very important to be looking at ANDFOMs on TMRs. Okay, just one more. Uh, I found interesting that you proposed different incubation times for non-forward fiber sources compared with forage, correct? So for the NDF. So when we grind forages, we're basically making them to behave like a, a non-forward fiber source in an in vitro or an in situ system. And we have always assumed that the NDF digestibility would not be affected by particle size like starch is. Like to make a starch degradation, yep. I think you need to incubate the as it is. So, what's your opinion on that? Should should we back in a little bit and start to incubate forages in a macro bag and not grinding them, or or because I, I can't see much difference between a ground forage and the and the wheat meat, for example. And in our experience, like total track digestibility of India for cereal fiber is basically very close to forage five C4 forage, basically. Yeah, the, the, the time points on the non-forages, um, if I remember correctly, uh, when, when they looked at, when Van Amber's group looked at all of these different, uh, they, they when they ran these, uh, this development side, they, they did the same time points that they did on the forages. Uh, they did it for all feeds and what it really came down to was finding the the uh, the time points that capture as much of that variance uh, and, and uh, was something that that could be commercialized uh, and with the non forages there was actually <laughs> there were several other time points that that were uh, that were being pursued, uh, but they just would not work in a commercial setting. They, they would have required people coming in at strange hours on an irregular basis. Uh, so, so these these three time points were able to capture that variance and capture that um, uh, those inflection points. And it, it's really it was more given how large some of the fast pool on some of these non-forages can be, it was really trying to find, uh, we needed those earlier time points to, to 
really be able to do the curve peeling to, to determine those rates. The particle size question is a great one. Um, and I'll, I'll, all I'll say on that is that that's why all of these are done, uh, the old utilitary uh, system in, in Flask. Uh, it, it's the, the, the potential for particle loss for the bags uh, is just is really high. Um, and so there's been this debate for years, Marcos, that, that Mertens has had on, do we really need to be looking at a particle size degradation, a new rate, uh, a rate of reduction, basically, to go from large particles to medium particles, then go to small particles, and each at each one of those points, there's degradation rate and the potential to pass uh, or not. Uh, he, he drew up on the board one day something that had like nine compartments for describing uh, uh, room and kinetics. And there's no way that we would ever be able to parameterize any of that. Um, so that there's, there, there's some work, uh, Mike just had a uh, student finish up that, that tried to do some of that modeling and try to take some of that into account. Um, from a modeling perspective, uh, from an actual analytical perspective, I don't know. I, I that that is beyond my uh, knowledge. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, I have a question from Paula. Um, this is Ignacio, and he says uh, maybe that you mentioned it already, but he didn't catch it. Does alfalfa have a higher fast pool of NDF than a C3 grass? Grass. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's it's mostly fast pool uh, with alfalfas, uh, and, and uh, that's that's actually why, in, in my exam my example is moving from a high fast pool to a higher slow pool, cost me a fair amount of intake and a fair amount of milk. Okay, um, would you be able to find that slide and just go over that again? Yeah, I'm I'm sort of looking for it too. Right there. Okay. So when I reformulated with the grass, and this is a C3 grass, UNDF240 as a percent of body weight decreased. Uh, UNDF30 as a percent of body weight decreased, but my 120, so this would be more representative of the size of the, fat, of the slow pool, increased a fair amount. And that's what, so then I hit fill, I hit room and fill and lost overall dry matter intake. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a question from Kelly Bean. And um, looking at the UNDF 30 um, hours as a percent of body weight in AMTS, it tells how much NDF was not digested at 30 hours, but not how much was digested. Is there a nutrient for total potential digestible NDF, or is he way overthinking this? For today, Kelly, you are overthinking it. Uh, there, that's a good idea, though, to give what the potential, well, the, the total potential digestible pool size would be the total carbohydrate B3 pool size. Uh, and that, we don't have that as a percent of body weight, huh? You got me thinking now, Kelly. Let me, let me chew on that. Okay, um, back up to Paula's question and the three pools and the difference between grass and alfalfa. Um, she just adds, and regarding corn silage, um, is, that, is corn silage a C3 grass? No, corn, 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 corn's a C4. Okay, all right. Um, do, do you need to expand upon that? Uh, well, and, and, and this, the, the ratio of fast versus slow uh, depends upon uh, hybrid and, and growing condition, especially the environment that it's grown in. 
Okay. I think Ignatio is wondering, is the difference greater with corn silage and alfalfa, I believe is what I'm interpreting, than corn silage, or I'm sorry, than alfalfa and the C3 grass? Uh... Corn can be somewhere in the middle of them, there, but there's, wow, you know, if we look at, these things can move around tremendously. If we look at just within corn silage, okay, so Minor Institute last year, uh, along with uh, uh, Don, um, Drawing a blank on his last name, uh, they started sampling corn silage at harvest. Well, they 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 started. Uh, they looked at three different dates of harvest, and then looked at the shift in NDF digestibilities, U pools, uh, from the beginning of har harvest to the end of harvest. And as that plant matured, sitting there just over like an 11 to 14 day period during harvest. Uh, there were significant shifts in uh, in those pool proportions and the total unavailable NDF. Uh, so it, it's it, it's really hard to to put a, a general guideline that 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 corn is more like alfalfa versus more like a C3 grass because it really depends upon the stage of maturity. Uh, and, and the envi environment that, that that corn plant was grown in. Uh, you know, here, here's a great example uh, with, in, that highlights the stage of maturity impact. Uh, triticale silage. Uh, same farm. This is all grown. Uh, it's grown as a winter crop. This is in New Mexico. Uh, when it's harvested at, with an NDF in the mid 40s uh, I've seen uh, NDF digestibilities to 31 22 40s be in the 80 uh, 92 95 percent level okay so 80 percent at 30 hour 92 at 120 95 to 97 at 240 hour cows love that stuff when it was harvested with NDFs around 60 percent uh, those same NDF digestibilities are more like 55, 62, 65. Okay, so this this stage of maturity has a huge, huge impact on NDF digestibility, uh, as well as as and again, it goes back to the growing seasons as well. Um, so we, we can move these things around on, on, on environment and, and stage maturity when we harvest, and we can make completely different crops by altering those two things. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Dave Barbano. In the study with grass and alfalfa, what happened to the concentration of fat and protein and grams per day output of each? <laughs> uh, David... My milk fat dropped um, about four points, uh, and I'm still fighting, fighting to try and get it back. Protein dropped about uh, pro protein dropped about a point, uh, and and that's concentration. And with the reduction in milk volume, yeah, we we got hit pretty hard on uh, kilos of fat and protein shipped. Uh, I obviously have been under a little pressure, <laughs> especially with where milk fat's valued right now. <laughs> I ran out of carb. I, I ran out of fermentable carbs. All right. Um, Marcos, do you have any more questions in your end? No, I'm done. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for the Thank time, for the patience, for the questions. See you around. Question. There's a question that came to me from Jose Ramirez. Ah. And his question is, my question is about corn processing methods. Is it possible that rolled corn have a different effect on starch availability besides the one of particle size? 
And the answer to that is yes, it does. Uh, when we get into corn processing, and this is where we can tell this by the bulk densities, um, what we're doing is is manipulating that that starch matrix. So, great example is a really good steam flake that in the U.S. we would call that a bulk density of 25 pounds per bushel. Will have um, because of the heat, the steam, and the rolling change that that starch matrix. Uh, a fair amount. Steam rolling is going to be somewhere in the middle of, of just grinding or it's going to be about the same as just grinding it. Uh, so as we manipulate that processing methods and, and processing uh, atmosphere, uh, we can greatly change uh, the, the starch digestibility numbers uh, actually more effectively than we can just by grinding. Okay, I have a question from Paula. And this is from Ignacio. Under drought conditions, would you expect lower NDF digestibility, or does it happen? Um, what happens in the contrary? Um, does the fast pool get higher? I think is what um, she's asking. Okay, so under drought conditions, we typically see NDF digestibility higher, uh, and and that is uh, primarily because uh, a lot of the time overall lignin is lower, but it's really the cross-linking is lower. Uh, let, let, let's think about this. Let, let's think of that your corn plant standing out in uh, the field uh, and you are uh, exposed to a lot of water. Your primary objective as a corn plant is to produce an ear and reproduce. So that means you have to stand. And if you sense that you're, that the soil's wet, you have the tendency to want to start to fall, you're going to increase the amount of cross-linking to be able to maintain up, to stay upright. Uh, lignin, lignification uh, is partially limited by uh, availability of water. So in a drought, we have less of that cross-linking, we tend to have higher, digesti higher digestibility. And from the little bit of numbers that are floating through my head, we tend to have higher fast pool sizes. Okay, um, thank you. And I, I'm sort of remembering a, a paragraph from Van Seuss's book that talked about that. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> can you, and this is from Carlos Nguyen, um, can you improve starch digestibility that you get with good steam flake corn if you use an extru extruder? Mm, yes, you can, Carlos. If we go through, extrusion is actually, uh, extrusion, actually an expander uh, is, is the best because we are completely disrupting that, that, that Zane uh, starch matrix and just blasting it apart. Paula says, thank you so much, Tom, and it was another great presentation. I do want to thank you, too. I think people really get a lot out of the opportunity to ask questions. So um, we were, we're winding down the year, and we'll have, um, remember, next month we'll have Dave Barbano, and um, Heather Dan will join him, and Tom will be here as well. So thank you, Tom. And Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening slash good day. All right. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody.